Sai will be joining us one day in the future. He's my other co-founder. <laughs> and let me give you a little bit of info about uh, the Unify platform. So Unify is built on Solana. It's a revolutionary platform that aims to aggregate products and service providers from multiple chains into one user-friendly ecosystem. Our vision is to empower businesses and individuals in the web-free space by providing a comprehensive solution for web-free navigation, consistent lead generation, and community engagement. And so welcome to another Unify podcast where we aim to demystify web free. Every week we interview business leaders, founders and individuals in or looking to enter the web free ecosystem. Our guests share their experiences, advice and their mistakes so that you can learn from the best. And today I'm very excited to introduce you to the cutest founder on any chain in web free and that's Snoo Soul. Um, Welcome, man. Pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, yeah, no, how's your day? Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. The usual long ass day uh, started at five today. It's it's fucking ten p.m. now. Uh, I don't know. It's it's a usual day in Web three. I I usually start at five <laughs> and just and I'm mental with these things because that's the only. I think five to eight a.m. is really the only time that I have like quiet time to exercise one thing because um i haven't been doing that really well and uh spend time with my dog <laughs> among many things oh so well that's usually, a great way like, to start the day man and w- oh yeah i was just saying it's like it's usually the, these long ass 5 to 11 even even like 11 30 p.m kind of days it was worse during the bull where we had mints at 4 a.m like that just fucked with me but things have been better things have been more predictable yeah the market is certainly uh not where it was in the bull that's for sure um and yeah i definitely remember staying up for mints and certainly slept through a couple that i'd been waiting for waiting for trying to keep my eyes open and then boom i've gone and seeing the floor price go to the moon and my whitelist go to waste (laughs) we've all been there um wicked man so let's get into it and the first question i want to ask you is how did you get into web3 nfts crypto um you know everyone seemed to have a different story so i'd love to hear that from you man so for me i think what's different is i actually entered and exit a couple a couple times um since i'm i'm an it graduate like i i finished off in uni it product management project management I got exposure to ETH when you could use ETH to buy a pizza. Um, funny enough, I th- it was a class and like the professor was just letting us play around with how it works. I don't know how rich he is now, but uh, that was my first <laughs> entry into the blockchain technically. What brought me back though was um, I think all of these like Axie Infinity and all that GameFi stuff happening on ETH and i stayed on eth and entered it with the idea that i wanted to save up for like uh for like the future and um initially got got rugged like one of the biggest plays that i had was board ape mirror club which OpenSea was just realizing what derivatives were during the time and that was also how i think me and a couple of friends moved into Solana. Uh, we got pissed off at how OpenSea was trying to control like copywriting because essentially when you move your NFT from left-facing to right-facing, it's a whole different IP. You're not supposed to call it a derivative, but they, they had different beliefs. And yeah, a lot of us didn't, didn't agree to it and we found ourselves moving into Solana. So yeah, I was one of the first... I didn't, I didn't realize like people were afraid of ETH whales then, but... Technically, I came from ETH, stayed on Sol. Uh, yeah, and then that's how it all started. Uh, basically, with the idea that there's there's some money to be made in the ecosystem, in NFTs, in liquid JPEGs. And because in real life, like I collect a lot of art, uh, it made sense. It made sense to just treat it like art trade. 
Yeah, I fully relate to that, man. I think um, it's interesting how many people did uh, begin on ETH and and then ventured over to Solana. I think ETH has that um, sort of more mainstream narrative. Like it's almost like the sort of high street of NFTs where it's like the go-to place. And then once you're in Ethereum, you discover like those boutique shops and the different chains, smaller chains with uh, different capacity and different community. So um, yeah, I can fully relate to that. And it's interesting. So you're saying you had the board at your club on a, on a different facing or, or what was that? Could you just <laughs> dive into that a little bit more? <laughs> so, it was the stupidest thing. But um, I had this like dope ass board ape yacht club. I think it was Steph Curry's, and then it was flipped right facing, and then it it flew from I think point zero one then all the way into like two ETH, and we held that roller coaster all the way back down to to unable to sell. It was the the funniest thing ever. <laughs> but <laughs> we live in we live and learn. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we have to hope that we do, man. Especially on uh, in Web three, everything moves so quickly. I think the learning curve, however steep, is also extremely fast because you know you have to adapt and and learn to sort of deal with those things. And we've all held until zero. You know, those diamond hands are not always the best hands to have. Um, yeah, so so that's and and what sort of time was that? Like, what year was that? I think this was like twenty late 2020s i'm sure right before the pandemic hit because when the pandemic hit i was already on solana yeah fair fair nice and so in solana like where was your your first sort of entry into solana what did you go into projects or were you just sort of you know just lurking and watching and seeing what was going on i entered projects right away because i think what makes me unique from a lot of people is that in real life, I work a lot of community. I work a lot of product. I mean, I lead a, I lead a team today of like 16 project managers and program managers. I literally manage a portfolio of projects. So building community and trying to figure out how each community at the sociology level actually works sort of was interesting to me. So I worked on like, I literally listened to a friend saying like this project's cool and i went into it and i went heavy i bought like 60 nfts i think this was this was cat cartel pre-run um and i started okay. buying it i think 0 0.18 0 0.2 levels and just coming up with i think at the max i had like 100 cats and volunteering wow. as like a community manager just to uh just to try to have control of my investment because that felt like big money then like i think i think that was like three eth worth of cats that felt like really really big money then uh solana was at like 250. so it felt painful to have that much nfts and i got overexposed into cats um so i think i eventually became the heart and soul of that project where there was a point in the server that i had literally my own meme that was dropped from like writing a command <laughs> um and then i even formed i even helped them form like a trait now like before utes and nouns DAO were a thing we already had that in cat cartel we called it the mobster DAO, where you had to have a mobster suit and those shit those things were selling for like 60 to 100 solana and it was so interesting to me because a lot of my university years, it was really a lot of community and community building. So being a community mod, it just seemed really interesting to be able to just activate and use what we do during university days and just trying to activate people, trying to get them active, trying to create things to do together in that server. And I think that's why even if utility wise, it was literally nothing like Cat Cartel other peak way they have the, you could have ordered a jacket you've got a shirt um they had this whole token staking and like token airdrop which had like a centralized lp that opened an ecosystem and then they had multiple factions that warred with each other but beyond it it was all smoke and mirrors i don't think there was anything built built 
outside of the projects that they launched, which were also rugs. Um, but it was really just that that pure community push and just me grinding up those servers and getting to know everyone that sort of launched them all the way to like I think at at their at their top there are like fifteen sixteen so. So from 0.18 all the way to 16, and then I think I started selling out towards like the tens, twelves, just because I was starting to realize that no matter what effort I was putting in, the project didn't seem to be moving the way I wanted it to. So I just said that okay, it's time to time to close this chapter and just move on. But I also in Cat Cartel built the rep of like being one of the few community mods that could actually activate the community like the crazy shit we do in pharaohs where we sort of do our own raids we sort of be our own noise we're we're toxic technically a lot of what the cats do like what they got known for was because they took out a lot of our core members in cat cartel and then turned it into cat rituals it just so happens that cats had more vibe and support from their founders to activate the community. Whereas in Cat Cartel, it was such a, I think sociology wise, it didn't make sense also because they were internal to the project. There was already three warring factions. So you're not going to have a very loud noise when internally there's a lot of quarrel. Yeah, definitely, man. And I remember Cat Cartel. I, I went in, I think around the two to three soul floor price and and rode that up a little bit i didn't have anywhere near as many as you and i i sold out just because i really struggled to keep a tab on um communities you know like i have to be super super bullish and really involved to um really take advantage of what those major communities do um but i really liked what you what you spoke about there um and it aligns with with one of my questions i had for you is you know what what has been the most effective method of community building for you um and i like the way you were talking about how you were able to activate your community so do you want to just talk a little bit more about that and and maybe relate that into um alpha pharaohs which we'll then dive into a little bit deeper Sure. I think, well, when I advise and when I when I sort of take the reins of any project that comes onto my lap, I mean, I've had the grunt because of what I did in Cat Cartel of being like the advisor to a lot of rugs that have new community, have new founders. A lot of the secret sauce to it is really understanding sociology, which if you're very keen with your sociology class, what's the basic unit of society it's family so it's really getting to know and sitting and manually finding out who's in that community beyond all the anonymity turning them into people turning them into personas that you literally talk to every day that will say good morning to you beyond the usual gm gm replies it's really sticking to one and finding out who's involved and how to how to rein in their talents the best they can. That's also what birthed a lot of what we did in Pharaohs. Because me and Tim, I think, um, when we came in, we came in initially as advisors. Like, a lot of people don't realize it, but technically, Pharaohs almost rugged. Um, they, were, they were two founders who were young, who had cool ideas, but didn't know how to execute. And me and Tim were coming in as like advisors. I was doing it for from the side of like alpha hunting and collabs since during that time, I think I was a collab manager for like 19 servers and I was still doing advisory. Tim was uh, coming in as like this thread or like he, he was the God thread or he, he'd write about projects. They'd pump because he'd write very detailed. He took the money boys from, I think, barely a project to literally being PFP'd by some of the Solana founders. And we just came together and advised them. Um, when we took it over, the first thing that we realized was we should we should just stop working externally, like with all these alpha servers that we control and all these <coughs> excuse me, all these hunting holes that sort of um, sort of act as like a server where you get collabs 
there was a lot. Um, I mean, Boryoku, notably one of them. But mm-hmm. I think that realization also came back to trying to activate who really were our believers, who was who really were the crowd that stuck around us. Because when we understood that the first formation of like Alpha Pharaohs was really all our friends. Uh, I mean, you have Saul, you have Sancho, you have yourself. Uh, Alpha Scientist was always there. Scrumps for a time was really active while he was active. Um, the the other the next founder that we adopted, Yido Stoner, they literally were the same kind of cut from the same cloth. Where we understood who were our friends and we just brought them all together, and we also knew like what we were good at. <clears throat> Like, I remember days where, um, because it was such a DGen server at first, we take jobs. Um, <coughs> excuse me, we take jobs to like literally create noise in servers. I think we we'd get paid like five sol, and then we turn it into prizes for the community. But this was literally me and Saul and. Um, me, Saul, and David literally just DMing in the in sacred chat. Yo, guys, let's make some noise. Drop your gifts. And then we even had VCs where we were teaching them how to how to raid. And that was re- really just the formation of something cool that we were good at that I think let us get to know a lot of the people inside the community. And then the fun just came. The fun just comes when you get you know the people. It, it was also a lot of borrowing off from like what we saw in, in Solana that actually worked and actually fostered brotherhood. Like, um, I tell this a lot when I, when I talk about dissecting why Tayo's pumped so hard. But that whole VC concept of just coming into VC and just talking and just planning your plays... That's also what tempted me to stop writing threads because I ended up doing spaces in VC just to get to know community, get to know the people and tell them about my plays, what I think mm-hmm. about the market. That's where it was birthed. The same case with Tim. He stopped He stopped threading elsewhere and just threaded inside Pharaohs, wrote his thoughts on everything. People would comment and people would try to beat Tim and he'd input how to be threadors. That's why... Uh, early stage pharaohs, you had at the time like 36 alpha callers, 28 hunters, because those were our friends just coming together and just having a, a common hole for us to chill and actually be human beyond uh, what the space wanted us to do. I love that. Um, I think that's really powerful what you've said because obviously, with Web3, does come and uh, and uh, <laughs> I can't think of the word um the anonymous factor right you're hiding behind pfps and um or not necessarily hiding but that's how you represent things right and um building that strength in community is not necessarily knowing what people look like but it's knowing the true personality that lives behind that pfp and if you connect with those i think you can relate that in like a marketing sense to super fans right there, there's always people in those early uh, stages of discord and community building in nft projects that are going above and beyond for you they share your sentiment and they have that sort of willingness to watch and help you grow where you can and give you that really valuable feedback and i think one of the the most um important factors of web3 is the community right like lots of people forget about that because you have these big hyped mint and you have all of this fomo but within that fomo bubble there are some really um, special individuals and you know i think they are responsible like you say for um pushing not only the founders but the projects forward you know and like things like going out and raiding which we'll get into in more detail um, which is what alpha pharaohs um has come to specialize in right um but things like going out and doing that in web 2 you would relate that i guess to affiliate marketing right so the the equivalent to that okay is is being a super fan and getting nothing for it right you just you just love what you love um it could be a musician it could be an artist but then when you go into affiliate marketing now you are incentivized to do the best you can by your community and by your founders and i when 
I came into Web3, like within just a few months, I really saw this all as affiliate marketing, right? Like if you are not having a presence on Twitter, you haven't got your community, your marketers shouting on your behalf, it is very um, difficult to be found, you know, and to and to really be noticed and gain that momentum that you need um, in order to succeed as an NFT project. And it's always really impressed me. Um, yourself and Tim have done such a fantastic job of building, I would say one of the biggest collection of super fans dedicated to pushing the alpha pharaohs brand forward um and you know what you've shared is, is really great advice and i think if you could round everything you've off you know if you could round off everything you've said um to give advice to brands or businesses looking to enter web3 and start their community what would be like the one or, or couple of points that you would you would highlight for them i think um a couple things one is uh something i coined before frank made popular but community curation you need to curate the kind of people the kind of populace the kind of the kind of sociology the kind of community that you're trying to build i think that's the first key to success in pharaohs it was a time when we didn't know what we had but when we figured it out we realized that we had the wildest trolliest loudest community like if we needed to get, gather attention we could do it so easily and mm -hmm. that's also what birthed and allowed us to to my second point to actually activate because when you know the audience that you've created it's easy it's much easier to activate and find what kind of image they all cohesively create um a lot of projects say they're creating community they're They've sort of curated their their whatever their holder base, but later on you'll see them with literally no one chatting, literally no mod getting to know whoever's there. Um, everyone thinking that community is just a bunch of whitelist spots and um, active people reacting on announcements. No, it's not. Uh, community started when you start to get to know people, when you start to build stories and understand lives and turn anonymity into something that has identity. Like, let's face it, the reality of it is there's no one who's truly anonymous. You have and enter the space as a new identity and you live on a stage where you're actually playing that new identity, which pivoting to where I, I'm at today, I mean, that's why with Nekozuma, it's been always so powerful with Jet always just lobbying a Web 2.5 dynamic where you are who you are in the real world. And that's always been powerful to me because uh, we're starting to see NFTs actually exist in the real world. Why are you so afraid of being who you are in the real world when, as you are, you are someone who's valued, who has actually good opinion, who could be just as good as who your PFP as whatever it is was. Like, what's wrong with being who you are in Web 2 as your Web 3 self? And I think, like, as the markets are starting to evolve, that's starting to become a more and more bigger thing, especially with all this content-driven um, social media. I mean, the algorithm has changed to actually prioritize content. But... Web 2.5 and getting to know identity, getting to know, getting to know your holder base, and finding ways to activate them and bring them all together, that's really the secret sauce to everything. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that's something that people really need to take note of is that you can't okay not that you can't you can come in and you can be whatever persona you want you know you do it's almost like you get to have a stage name right you get to have your um your pfp and your stage name in web3 but your skill sets and your personality and everything else 
is relevant in web3 because that's what makes you who you are and if you if you stay true to that in web3 i think it's when you find the most success right like i know i i think i can really relate to what you said because i was sort of in web3 and i was like you know where where do i fit in here like what what's my you know what's my persona going to do and the minute that i dropped that and actually became who I am in web two is, you know, someone who networks, I'm an entrepreneur, you know, I've had various um, successes and failures. And one of my my skills is sort of bringing people together, you know, putting the dots where people maybe have missed something and joining those together and putting two people that can really succeed in a room or in a chat together. And that's what really, I think, once I started doing that, I really found my feet in web three. Um, and so, yeah, I really love that, man. And, and thank you so much for sharing that. And so, like, the next question I had is, how important to you is um, utility now in the bear market? So I think it's it's a different story if you're in a bull market and there's hysteria and FOMO and money flying around. But now we are seeing the the builders, the people who are building what I would call you know, like a Web2 equivalent sustainable business, they're the ones that seem to be feeling a little bit more confident through the bear. And we're seeing those that didn't do that, they had their mint funds, they're relying on royalties, that's all gone. So how, how important do you think it is if you are an existing project or thinking of building in in, an, in the Web3 ecosystem, be it on Solana or any other platform, uh, blockchain, how important do you think having relevant and sustainable utility is now? So I think there's there's a lot to digest in that one question, right? Like um, mm -hmm. one thing, one thing to start is that utility is useless when there's no noise around it. If a tree fell in the middle of the woods, did the tree actually fall? It, it no one knows, right? That's exactly the case of utility without any marketing, without any eyeballs, and that's why a lot of utility projects fail. Because what's a product? when there's no adoption. Um, any good product manager would tell you that you need the change management, you need the adoption strategy to actually get that product ready and fit into market. So the fact that you can build something cool is one facet of a very complex supply chain that actually ships your project out. I think that's where a lot of builders fail. They don't realize that. The other is um although smoke and mirrors will always dictate floor price like the hype the social speculation the the fomo creation that might create floor price but what sustains floor price that's where utility comes in if you're able to have utility that keeps keeps their volume moving then you actually have a project that can sustain itself. The third thing that I think needs to be dissected is, is a project successful if the floor price is lower than than what it needs to be, or if, if it's lower than the mint raise? A lot of people in the space often think that when a project drops below mint, it's a failure. But if I'm going to be very honest, and you can look into any textbook, Every project is defined by a project goal. And once that goal is achieved, the project should be designed to either pivot into a next phase or close. Now, a lot of people think that projects need to run forever, at least anyone, most people in Web3. But the fact of the matter is they don't need to run forever. They just need to achieve what they're set out to do. And floor price does not measure its success. So. You have projects like uh, Reposa, which is way, which is below mint. I mean, it's, it's at one soul now. But is it a, is it a failure of a project? I don't think so, because one, uh, their goal has always been to raise a coffee business that becomes sustainable. They already have a roaster. They already have shops. They already have supply chain. They already have e-commerce. So technically, project goals they're all they're all hitting hitting their marks. I think. Floor price is just dictated by what the market sentiment is, but a project success isn't. Um, now, how that ties into utility, 
I mean, you're you're looking at it, right? Projects have to be defined by what they set out to do. Their project goal, their sprint plan, their sprint goal. If you if they're looking into agile methodologies, so you need to decouple one from the other to measure if something's successful or not. Um, utility is designed to, I think, in most cases, it's not designed for perpetual project floor. It's just designed to to cement what the project was set out to do. If that was to give revenue back, then okay. If that was designed to be the most hype project, then okay. But I think we need to we need to decouple floor price as a as a measurement for success, and we need to look at utility as sort of what it's supposed to be, and that's why fair value comes into into play. The fact of the matter is fair value for a lot of NFT projects, they're bloated. They're not even supposed to be at that floor. But because of all the speculation, mm-hmm. because of all the illiquidity, and I think that's why I'm enjoying this whole liquid asset, uh, the speed of transactions as of late and the speed of liquidation as of late, because it sort of forces the market onto itself. And we're not kept at the market where it's so illiquid that uh, floor prices just keep pumping. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, there is a lot to be said for floor price not being an accurate reflection of a project's success or inherent value. Um, we see it across the board with many projects. I know Alpha Pharaohs have been up and down. You know, in my opinion, you guys are onboarding more new users into an ecosystem, which again, in my opinion, makes you one of the most valuable projects on the chain. Because if you are able to introduce new users, you are not only bringing sustainability to a project, a business, you're bringing sustainability to an ecosystem because naturally what will happen is as those people get more experienced um, from entering in through Alpha Pharaohs and, and the Tomb Raid platform, they will then venture out with that new experience, with their new connections, and they will start entering other projects. And if you can um, attribute those new users to yourselves, I think to me, that puts you at the top of um, success, value and utility. And, you know, I really relate Unify um, in the same way, in the sense that what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide a platform for projects like yourselves and every other artist, um, you know, freelance marketer in Web3 and utility based projects to have a single place, a single platform where Web2 users can come with no barrier to entry, you don't need a wallet, even though we're fully on chain, you can sign up with an email and you can now access a a plethora of great projects. And within that is built community marketing, community verification systems. So you'll actually be able to see these projects that are defined by their success, but on the, on the, instead of by floor price, it's going to be by how the community react to that, you know, and, and if Alpha Ferris, for instance, um, are on Unify, you're going to see the feedback, the reviews and the status of that project grow. And that's going to give you um, a much safer and secure entry into the web free ecosystem. So I, I really love what you guys are doing. And, and in a minute, we'll flick over to another screen and I've, I've got um, Tomb Raid up so we can, you know, just discuss and you can maybe go through, um, you know, just the main landing page and give people an idea of, of what it is that you guys are, are providing and how this platform is onboarding all of these new users. And um, before we get into that, I wanted to ask you, like, what was your most important lesson? Um, you've spoken about like your journey from ETH into Solana, um, through Cat Cartel and into um, Alpha Pharaohs. And I know that you, you said you came on as an, uh, as an advisor in the first instance, but obviously now you guys are the founders, right? Like you and Tim. So um, yeah, what was the most important thing or things that you learned 
in that process um, that you want to share with people, you know, who have no idea or have, you know, their own version of this? Hmm. <clears throat> like just inside the pharaohs or in in everything in Solana? No, yeah, with all of your experience, I know you, you, you know, you've, you've helped multiple projects. So, you know, being a founder, or I guess, seeing founders found product projects, you know, what have you noticed to be um, the most important uh, methodology or best practices? Okay. Um, for me, like, mis like, the first question on like mistakes or learnings, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned is um, when it comes to like the the whole socials and Twitter and really um, finding alliances in the space. Um, everyone sort of is because of how small it is is connected to one another. So there is no room for enemies in the space. Um, you could have, you could be on the timeline, uh, funding whichever project. And then a few minutes later, come into your discord and then see holders of that project you were funding actually being holders of your own project. Like that's a commonality. Um, realizing and just understanding that the space is only 2000 people. I think that opens eyes to a lot of things and that that makes you also understand how much more difficult it is to actually compete and to actually go through a build up in a mint process because you're asked you're at this rate asking 2000 people to buy at least five NFTs each if you want to get them through a 10k collection. I think that one realization sort of also opens up a lot of subtopics to discuss, but it is what it is. I think that's probably the most token thing that uh, I've learned and that I've sort of understood more and more in the space. So, so I think what I'm hearing you say is, you know, stay positive um or say nothing really it's not about trying to tear down other people and if you do have something to prove prove it by doing and not by saying you know um because the ecosystem as it stands now is is small and like you said there may very well be people that hold your project when you're shouting your mouth off at another project and this can have a, a negative effect on both your reputation and your project maybe maybe go let's let, maybe we can go deeper even i think what what i really want to say is more um it's not how you carry yourself it's more on because it, it's okay to critique it's okay to have opinion it's okay to make noise but critique in private like coach scold critique call out in private and praise in public i think if if more people follow that principle like there'd be less toxicity there'd be more growth and you'd actually have a more community focused solana yes yes and yes um i think and we've seen that escalate more in the bear market um would you say it seems people are looking around more than they're focusing on building through the bear and and maintaining sustainability it's become you know grabbing um engagement and attention through negativity more so than um developing and growing um independently yeah it's a real shame um and i think you know, there's a lot to be said, and I've said it before regarding the responsibility of both investors and project founders um, to um, hold themselves, ourselves, to a higher standard of um, realizing that we are the 
the founders overall of such a young ecosystem and you know we're 1994 1996 of the internet um in terms of web3 and we have the ability to sort of build a foundation of something really special and incredible and people will look back on this historically um you know after the cbdc's come in and everything's on chain and you know kidneys are nfts and who knows what else are nfts maybe number plates and property deeds um <laughs> And they're going to look back on these Twitter feeds and we're we're shouting at each other about um, irrelevant and and, um, you know, slightly, I'd say, like undervalued points, you know, when actually we should be focusing on what this utility can be, because for me, NFTs are are everything, you know, they're the barcodes to the world, you know, and I think that's where things will go eventually. And it's it's up to us to shape that you know and and those of us that i think can adapt and and rise up to the challenge will be the ones that are still standing in in three four ten years you know and and will really benefit from it agreed agreed although on that i feel like um maybe use cases um will be more difficult as it comes like I, i've started to see a little bit more race towards an ai forward blockchain which i'm not sure how nfts fit in it well they they might fit in it into into a world that just says if something is actually organically built but that what what use case is that for like all these pfp projects that are just randomly floating up left right and center there's no reason to be to have a pfp project if and if these come into that use case yes and i i agree you know i wonder how many pfp projects can any chain sustain because um you know okay maybe banksy comes in and does a pfp project that would go wild maybe artist with an irl reputation that will do well as a pfp because people are not so much buying a pfp they're buying a piece of art you know and, and a first on-chain venture for these artists but i do wonder how i mean no doubt we will see pfp projects in every bull cycle right um but i do wonder the the inherent sustainability of the originals you look at um you know the punks and stuff like that where they are I would say borderline more art than PFP and they have that historic sort of angle to them. Um, I do wonder how time will fare against the the less, um, how would you call it, like the less reputable art and artists behind PFP projects, you know? Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, nice. Um, wicked, man. So it's such a fantastic conversation, man. You've got a wealth of knowledge and, and so much experience. And I wanted to just touch on your like advisory and your consulting. So um, I know, I don't know if you want to name all of the projects that you work with um, and just maybe give us some idea on that. I know there will be people who've done similar um IRL education and will no doubt eventually be looking to get into web3 and there'll be others who have maybe the level of experience you have from being in the ecosystem but are not sure how to implement it so you could maybe just give us some thoughts on on your advisory roles and and how that works for you you know so i think compared to most quote-unquote advisors in the space i sort of pride myself with one, a really finite scope. Uh, two, a methodology that actually is from Web2. And three, I think I'm one of the few people that work forward instead of working backward. And I say this in the, in the sense that most advisors would come to you, ask you how much is your mint raise, how much NFTs, what mint price it is, and then say, well, I'm making 10% of that. Um, I think with the way we work at thunder and i'm just another third of like that whole engine that is thunder studios um we work it such a way that marketing lines up with your raise your raise is just designed to be the first phase of a longer relationship a longer journey with us and we're one of the 
I think only few uh, firms that actually focus on raise to operate, meaning um, we work more like how we work in the real world where a raise is just an IPO and an IPO just leads into a new company. A new company leads into a clientele that actually needs advisory, needs guidance, needs uh, someone to tell them their EBITDA is not making it, someone to tell them that their operations are faulty, someone to connect them with the right legal team, the right uh, strategy team, someone to tell them that they need to do a second raise, uh, all that. I think that's where sort of we differentiate at Thunder. And this is just because we're a good uh, set of like skills from the real world. I mean, you have Jet, who is like a, a serial entrepreneur VC. Uh, you have me, who literally runs Fortune 100 projects at the <laughs> NMAS. And then you have Shivas, who is, uh, I mean, professionally, he's a marketer. And he's marketed in some of the toughest industries. He's worked inside the fitness industry for almost, I don't know, 15 years. Which, if ever, I mean, fitness has always been such an such a challenging thing to market because that's literally the bread and butter of what fitness is. So gyms, uh, supplements, all that. Like Shivas is the man to do it, and I think just clubbing all those skills together and then turning it into something that pivots into a retained business where we're literally telling founders, you should you should focus on your community. Like, look at it from a sociology perspective. Or telling them that um, there's a gap with your, with your expenses. You're looking at it at only your OPEX. But what's your actual, what's your actual burn rate month on month to sustain your project? Were, are royalties enough to do that? I don't think so. So we tried to pivot you guys into like a, a business operation that is actually operating instead of being reliant on royalties and constant purchasing because you guys can't create the purchasing narrative. Yes. I think that's sort of where I differentiate, at least compared to a lot of advisors out there because we know our lane, we know what we're good at, and we know, uh, we know that what we work on, they actually pivot into things that actually achieve their project goals compared to all these smoke and mirror projects where we'll launch a 10K collection, we'll raise 50K, and then we'll vanish after three months because we didn't really have a goal. I mean, not, not to bash, but yes. a lot of other advisors, that's what they do. Yeah. No, I love that. And I think you're absolutely right in, uh, as and you know, this is just from me knowing you for the for the past few years um you know we've gotten closer over the more recent months but i've seen your reputation and i've seen how you carry yourself and how you um the way the project you're involved with do so well because you know what you've just said is you come at it from a web 2 perspective and i think this is a big factor that is missing in web 3 is because we are born out of a FOMO, right? We're born out of just insane money for JPEGs, you know, initially, that that sentiment carries through now in a time and in the bear market or the bull market, the, it, it carries through in a time where actually all of these projects are funding they're raising for a business right you know people are investing their money okay some of them are flippers but like we said about building these um super fans and this um community those people don't want to flip you know like they've bought like yourself in cat cartel you bought 60 you know you don't necessarily have the intention to flip out maybe you're going to flip out to 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 gain your initial investment but are you actually um there just to make money and get out or are these people there to see your business do well? And I think there is so much space, um, especially in the bear market, for businesses with that intention, you know, to build for long term, for longevity, for sustainability. And yes, you can pivot. Yes, you can launch different collections once you've got that sustainability. But when people just sort of go up and then back down, it becomes like this cycle of like just taking liquidity out of the ecosystem and that's not sustainable for any anyone involved and um i really hope to see 
that sort of sentiment changing towards when you come to do an NFT collection, okay, you need to have nice art, you need to do cool PFP or whatever you want, but, but within that is this um, longevity in mind, you know, and the community in mind, because um, as a founder, I feel responsible to make sure that what I'm doing will benefit not only myself, not only my community, but the ecosystem. And I don't feel like we see that enough from, from uh, many projects, you know. I think there's like a there's like a sandcastle in in that whole phrase. Um, I think it's problematic when we start to look at NFT raises as an actual business raise, because I mean Wall Street will cop you down on it at the fact that why is this being raised like a security when it isn't a security? The moment you promise your holders that they act like shareholders to a business that um, will do X you sort of play into the eyesight of the SEC. And I think that's that's also fundamentally what's the problem with, with NFTs. The moment I turn people who hold an NFT, an NFT collection from 5,000 buyers into 5,000 stakeholders into whatever I'm doing is in itself a problem. I think we're starting to see, and you can see how that's been impossible for a lot of the space and that's why people are down really bad is because the fact of the matter is we've scope creep what nfts are supposed to be when essentially it's supposed to be attuned to a seasonal release for fashion or like shoes like when an air jordan one releases you're only ever going to have that much supply you're only ever going to buy that one air jordan and that's all it will ever be. You don't own Jordan. But what we've done in NFTs is we've turned it so that, no, 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 you own Jordan when you buy this NFT. And that's why founders are, that's why founders are leaving, are rugging, have insane expectations because they promise you that you act like an owner, which you aren't. I mean, just because you give capital to allow them to execute doesn't mean that you're supposed to be acting like a shareholder. I think that's where a lot of projects need to start redesigning themselves, right? And you're seeing some of the projects who have smarter corporate structuring actually be the ones that work really well. Heist, for example. Um, no one talks about Longwood Labs, but Longwood Labs controls what the Heist does. The Heist is initially just that IP, that game. That's all it. That that's all it is. That is all it'll ever be. And your NFT just allows you to play. I think that model works. But the mo moment you turn it into like, no, 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 you become a shareholder for X. And because you're a shareholder of X, you get revenue share from everything we do. That's a security. That's where the SEC is copying down. That's why the SEC has such a, such a big crosshair on the NFT raises of the, our, our entire ecosystem. Because people have been selling that message. It's not supposed to be. You're supposed to be selling the message of this is a club. This is a, this is art. This is consumable. This allows you to play. This allows you to act, have access to this, to that, to this. Never mm -hmm. deciding power. Unless, of course, you're going to use it as a DAO, then it will always just be a DAO. Stop, we need to stop scope creeping everything into this convoluted department store of utility and just focus on what it is. yeah fair i like what you're saying i understand what you're saying completely because i think when you look at how bigger brands are looking at thing at web3 and digital ownership um take starbucks for instance with their loyalty program okay they are utilizing what is a trending technology um but also they are giving ownership of the asset that they're giving away right but that's again like a piece of memorabilia right it's like if you bought the t-shirt from a particular football match um you know but now it's it's a finite amount and there's only x y and z amount and and you have ownership of it or uh, what i really like is the consumer contact like so understanding what your consumers are doing with 
what they are getting from you. So if they're getting an NFT, maybe it's for free, maybe it's paid, maybe they've bought it, but you now have that connection with their wallet and you can see what do they do? Do they trade it? Do they flip it? Do they hold it? Do they, you know, does it go somewhere else? And I think we haven't seen that sort of um, direct relationship to individual consumers before. And, and that really excites me um, for the potential there. And again, like I think communities, again with Unify, like one of the things I envision the community of Unify having would be like being like a test pool, right? So brands will eventually reach out to us and say, right, well, we want to, to provide something in the NFT space. We don't want to worry about building discords and all of this, but we do want to, to co make contact with consumers interested in our product. Can we offer a drop to your community might be free, might be paid, they would get that. And now that uh, brand that's provided that drop now has some like, I guess, analytic feedback data from within a new ecosystem that they can monitor, utilize and adapt with their thing going forward, whether they come back again or they then decide to go and do something. Um, I think that's a really powerful part of, of being this early in here, you know? I agree, I agree. I think that's why, like, for these dev shop projects, like, I always tell them, you know, you should focus on turning your user base into your first adopters and your first users instead of just trying to make money off of them. Because the fact of the matter is you're not supposed to be even promising them future money and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, with Unify, we're not even, although we have planned for an NFT collection, like really and truly, we are looking at ourselves as a platform that will benefit the ecosystem and it's cross chain, it's any chain, you know, anyone can use it, but it, we want it to be a window into web three for web two users. And whether or not we do an NFT collection down the line, we are building, you know, like we, we just last night, we had our meeting with the dev, we saw our first UI, like obviously we've seen the back end in code, but now we're actually seeing the, it attached to the Figma. And, you know, we're not out here going to mint, you know, we're not out here trying to get any money because we know that actually what we need is we need to build an MVP and we need that use case and we need to see the consumers using it and the the uh, projects and business using it. And that will tell us where we go with it. But no matter what, we have that faith in, in the fact that um, blockchain is not going anywhere, right? It, it, okay, it's, it, Solana could go to zero, but the chain's still going to exist. You know, the technology is still there. There's so much being built on these chains um, that it, there's no way it's going anywhere. And the fact that the government uh, have got so many eyes on it since we went from like, you know, a, a million users to 800, it's, it's huge, you know? And I think... Um, the future is bright, but you just have to see it much more as a business and um, and less like this sort of money, like a way to get money from people, you know, like it's um, sustainable crowdfunding or something like that is a, is a better right sort of methodology to look at it from, I think. No, you're right. I think the, to turn, to turn the NFT space and any chain into Kickstarter for what it's worth is already it's not gonna last. It won't it won't work for long. No, no, agreed. Awesome, man. So I'm just going through, I've got some more questions for you. How are you doing on time? You know, like do give me a heads up if you need to get on. I know you've had an extremely long day. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm actually decompressing now. So <laughs> this is cool. I oh, am fantastic. open and just chilling. Outstanding, man. Um, so look, um, let's go into Alpha Ferris, um, and let's talk about Alpha Ferris. Let's talk about your rise from raiding Twitter to now raiding multiple social media platforms and the task to earn. I know I have been blinkers on with Unify and I haven't looked up enough. I know I sort of touch in with you and Tim and, and I know the foundation of what's going on, but I'd love to understand more. Um, so if you want to um, 
dive into to Alpha Pharaohs, that would be fantastic. And just start wherever you want to start on that. Sure, man. Um, kind of difficult to start because, uh, as I always say, <laughs> when you drive a Ferrari, you don't talk about it. You just drive it out of the garage. I think that's always been the the weird philosophy, and probably that's why our floor is so low. Because uh, I don't chill when I'm on space. But um, for what it's worth, um, Alpha Pharaohs, we've always been known as like the loud community, the loud expansive community. And that's centered with uh, our raid to earn platform for normies raiding is like on any social as of late so whether that be instagram twitter uh snapchat threads facebook um technically myspace we can actually also do it but you literally commensurate pharaohs to react like comment retweet repost uh share follow as of as of late also um on any of these socials and you do it by giving a certain amount of solana and for all pharaohs to eat up after it so basically allowing us to engage and rally behind your socials and reward us in whatever form of payment that you want um it was initially started as like a means to just activate our community because We've always been doing it um, manually, at least in the early days, and that's how we got known. Mm. But the platform came along, and that's sort of what took center stage for a while. I think it's also why like, um, it's gotten so bad that because we're so loud on the timeline, when people start seeing Pharaoh PFPs on any form of Twitter post, they feel like it's botted because of how um how loud and wild we tend to get and i think there are a lot of like design cues that um sort of justify it like the if you're in sneakers the pharaoh silhouette is so common for all the pfps that you feel like it's the same pfp eight million times and it's a problem that's why um we, me and tim are really excited for this for this art overhaul that we're entering because I feel like it changes the silhouette in such a way that it makes things interesting. Um, at least that's the first part of the coin. Um, beyond it, we also have what we call task to earn, and I'm not sure if anyone can see the task to earn platform. But let me yeah, try. Let me see to... if I can. Oh. Yeah, I should be able to pull it up. I've got it set up here. Let me bear with me, guys. It is I'm using OBS and I am about to transition in another screen. So hopefully all will go smoothly and we can see the two made screen. Okay. That is Tomb Raid. Let me just move that over there. So I just need to sort my windows out a sec. There. That can go there. That can get minimized there. Boom. Right. Is this the right one? Nope, it's a rug. They're all rugs now. Is that working? <laughs> I don't see it, but I hope everyone else does. On on YouTube, yeah, we've got it on YouTube. So Let's just see. Screen share. Just doesn't seem to be picking up my um, the movement on it. How's that looking on YouTube? Just check. If you can see that, would you? I'm just going to ping it to you on Discord in that chat we're in. There's a link for YouTube. If you just go there, see if you can see the screen share. Um, I thought it would be live. I don't know why it's not. Oh, I can, uh, yeah, I can see it. 
Yeah, you can see it there. Yep, 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 yep. There's a bit of delay, but yeah. Um, so, Tomb Raid, for what it's worth, it um, you can go to the task section, and that opens um, sort of our way to do affiliate marketing for Pharaohs. Uh, we have this all on-chain and automated where there are certain deals that we've cut with a lot of these companies, like Web2 companies, where if you do certain things and complete the tasks, um, you get rewarded um, in various forms. Like, I know people have made like $200 from some of the ta these tasks, and they're geolocked. So what I'm seeing is very different from what uh, YSE is seeing. Um, so you're seeing tasks here, which you literally just need to complete it. And one of the pharaohs, uh, one of the pharaoh teams will validate that it was finished. And then once it is finished, um, you'll sort of after after a confirmation and validation process, you'll get rewarded in the form of points or USDC. So there are things like surveys, um, signing up to like a casino to gift it, sending a free gift to X or Y, um, watching videos, all that stuff. So instead of watching your your ads, um, like instead of watching those ads on YouTube, you can just do it on Task to Earn and that would sort of give you money as well <laughs> instead of just uh, skipping, skipping, skipping. But yeah, um, it was a way to sort of give a new dimension to the tasks. Um, we're testing it with some hotels, so hotel reviews. We're also testing it with some events, so event attendance and all that stuff. But essentially activating your community or activating Web2 through Web3 means. Wow, okay, so so that is basically as i understand it this is open to the public right yep and so anyone can come on here and start earning um do they need to hold an nft to do this or they can just come in and start earning straight away like how does that work they can just come in and start earning straight away um for pharaohs, you you make a little bit more. You also get joined into a jackpot, which at the end of at the end of the day, um, you get rewards from if you hit the jackpot. But it's designed Incredible, essentially to right? have and so you, lots of people. Cool. Go ahead. Yeah. So I was going to say so. What we're seeing here is I just love this. Is is exactly what we were talking about in terms of of using your your feet in uh, web free and on chain, but you're opening the the power of that up to web two companies to start gaining exposure to it in a way that just involves absolutely no real need to understand what's happening, right? Like they don't need to open wallets. As, am I right in saying this? They, they can just literally um you know speak to you about providing these tasks and then they gain the advantage of um being exposed to your users completing them yep yep yep, yep. uh it's just uh there's just a very intricate onboarding process for for anyone who wants to set up a task for them uh i think we'll start streamlining it once there are more deals but with the ten thousand deals i don't think we'll be uh, I don't think there's lots of reason to start streamlining it. Like, for now, it's just a matter of like get, getting those tasks to complete and getting the word around. Because I think when people start figuring out what we're capable of, um, it's just it's just up to mass adoption already, right? Um, there are a couple people who have like sent us valuations for how much pharaohs could actually be, and I know, man. I, I'm I'm excited to just see how how it evolves because right now it's it's utility that just sustains itself, and we've only made it public only is... ever so recently. 
Yeah, yeah, I remember the announcement. And it's... um. I just love to see this, man. Like, this is, for me, is the vision of of what Web3 is all about. You know, is obviously, eventually, all of these companies will be on some sort of chain. But I think the intermediary process of onboarding um, uh, Web2 and Web2.5 people is, is exactly what you're doing here. Um, because the minute they start seeing, well, we're making money or these tasks, we get an extra promotion, whatever you, you know, whatever they've put up here as, as the task when they're completed and to a high standard, they're going to start to see the value of that. And you mentioned about exposure, right? You mentioned about, um, you know, the, 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 the issue. And this is, you know, the, the problem solution that Unify has seen, right, is they are all of these fantastic utilities and products and frankly this is one of one of the best um but they do not get the same exposure web 2 companies would get when you're running your marketing and advertising right and they if let's say someone doesn't find this website first they hear about alpha ferris and they hear about raiding but they don't know how to find it how do they find it right they have to go into crypto twitter and once they're in crypto twitter they have to learn to navigate round and find a discord link or the web link oh. and then they go in oh can you hear me i think i lost him hello i can hear you okay i think you're back oh okay where did you uh where did you get up to where was i they go into crypto Twitter and then dot dot dot. Yes, yeah, so so in order to un to discover um, utility projects such as yourselves or um, yeah, so let's just focus on you guys. So if someone wants to find uh, Tomb Raid and they don't find the web link, they have to go into crypto Twitter. They then have to navigate crypto Twitter, find Alpha Pharaohs. They then either choose to go to the link to the website and work it out from there or they would need to go into a Discord. Now, straight away, there are barriers to entry there. And what Unify aims to do is absolutely remove those barriers to entry. So although we are, again, fully on-chain, um, um, you know, you can create your own on-chain e-commerce brand stores, um, they come with community marketing built in, you will be able to find it on a Web2 front. So you will see a window into web3 and all of these products and all of these service providers that you find they will look familiar in a sense of amazon right you, you know you scroll through and you'll see a shop that sells this or a product a provider that sells this and um what we allow for then is a a easier way for people to find web free products and services without really recognizing the fact or having to write down a seed phrase you know and for us this is like a major factor in in the issue of sustainability within web free because we are i would say in an echo chamber overall you know yes we come out yes you guys are coming out and people are coming from web 2 and they're, they're they're able to to use your services but imagine that on a broader scale and with adverts running, with um, affiliate marketing happening happening to each brand, each page, and then the whole website. So the way we've set this up is you can um, generate affiliate links for a singular brand page, a singular product, or the entire website. And no matter what happens, everyone gets a commission when a sale goes through. So if you are promoting Tomb Raid, but they come on and they go to Tomb Raid and they actually go and buy a hat from um, ODK, for instance, then you're still getting a commission. And it creates this positive feedback loop where everyone is inherently um, uh, incentivized to go out and really push your um, product and service to a whole new audience. And then on top of that, because of the affiliate link, you can now take your product and service off crypto twitter out of the echo chamber and you can post these in blog posts you can put these in email marketing campaigns so you imagine if you are an affiliate marketer already with an established email list and you're now able to go and take something like tomb raid and start promoting that to let's say business to business as actually onboarding new uh, tasks 
then you are essentially going to be picking up fairly substantial commissions with a system that you've already built in Web2. Um, and that for us is, is one of the most important factors of Unify and what we feel um, web, web3 is missing in terms of accessibility by um, non-crypto natives. Love it, love it, love it, love it how there's such a, such a niche problem that you guys are solving as well. Because I think that's where, that's where a lot of people are struggling, like that whole, how do I reach out beyond the walls of Web3? Yep. Right. And you guys have the perfect solution to it. Yep. Yep. We we this is what we've you know, you see problems, right? And you and you you try and find a solution to it and I mean we've been working on this for over a year, you know, to bring this to fruition and and you know, we've been now building the devs been coding this for um coming up for three months. And we're very close to going to um, closed beta testing. So, you know, we're really excited and, and really think that this is something that's going to benefit um, not just um, Web3, but you could come in as a Fiverr, someone who's got a gig on Fiverr, and now you can go and you can expose that to Web3. And, yep. you know, again, if you're a brand and you're looking to do an NFT collection, where the fuck do you start? Right. Like, where do you go if you're completely non crypto native and you want to make an NFT collection and build a discord community where well, you go to Unify and you can have the uh, the artists. You'll see how highly renowned they are. You'll see their reviews and you will see their feedback and you will see their community. You'll see the legal teams that you can use. You'll see the marketing. You'll see the advisors like yourselves and you'll be able to pick and choose from a curated selection of the true tried and tested um, service providers um, of the highest quality and yeah. that way your entry into web3 will be much safer and more secure dope. Dope, dope, dope. yeah i'm 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 excited and extremely biased <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to hit you with a few more questions and then, um, you know, I want to let you settle down and spend a bit of time with your dog before you pass out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's cool, man. She's asleep. She's asleep. Oh, she, beautiful. She'll wake me up at 5 a.m. again. Oh, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> um, so where are we? Like, we've been through a lot. Um, we've spoken about Tomb Raid. We've spoken about the task to earn, which is just so exciting, man. Like, I'm so impressed with that. I think you've done a fantastic job. Um, and, yeah, so do you want to um, share, like, the the most difficult factor of running um, a web-free business? Um, and you could relate that to and you could relate to both your consulting and like the the difficulties you see across multiple projects or you could just focus on alpha pharaohs and and some of the the difficult points that you've you've come across there i know one of them has been keeping up with elon musk um changing <laughs> the api entries and stuff like that <laughs> honestly i think the the difficult part in whether Pharaohs, Nekos, or Thunder, or even with like projects that I advise, mm, it's really maneuvering your way around all these half ass scammers and um, snake oil salesmen in the space. Because a lot of people, <laughs> when well, you're bro. when you're up, <laughs> when you're up, bro, everyone everyone wants you. Like when your floor is above ten soil, you're like the talk of the town. Um, so slowly, slowly volume dies, and then suddenly, nope, nope, nope. We're not paying for you. You're not. You're not allowed into our club anymore. And then you realize who we're really there for you. Um, I think that's also why, like, um, like we've seen Jet on the timeline. Uh, my, my co-founder for Nekozuma. Um, we've seen him go from like D God Maxi to uh, fudding D Gods to leaving X Plus to all that stuff. Because 
it doesn't matter your PFP, no matter how expensive it is. Most of the people, and I say most, um, most of the people are really just snake salesmen. They just they're just here to play PvP and pump their own pump their own bags, pump their own bias. Rarely do you see people who are like minded, who actually have a priority for the common good. And when you meet these people, you sort of take care of them. I think that's also why um, I, for example, when the bear fully hit, instead of like consolidating into uh, a blacksmith or like a D God or any of these other blue chips, I just chose to enter the Dead King Society where I found a lot of people who I echoed. Uh, values and principles with and that's enough uh, that's enough breathing room for my sanity because most of the other communities I mean because they're so popular right um, they're also filled with the same dangerous players that we sort of tippy toe around so I guess the, the real alpha is like Find people that you know you will learn off of, that can be mentors, that you share common values with. Um, strangely enough, um, and I think I realized this after saying yes to Jet, um, NF Tim is a de very devout Christian. Strangely enough, when I entered Nekozuma, I found out three months later that Jet is just as devout a Christian as uh tim so unspokenly i think god decided to surround me with like people who share the same belief chain as me so even if i'm not as like uh well practiced uh in my religion i ended up having to work with people who are so uh the values just transcended i um I really appreciate that, man. And I think um, I, uh, I've i been saying for some time, like, I'm not a religious man, but I am a spiritual man. And um, I certainly believe in a higher power, but I believe in the power of, of us, you know, as individuals um, and the ability to steer our future. And one thing I have noticed since being in Web3 is the speed of manifestation when you stay focused seems to be extremely accelerated um whereas in comparison to in web 2 irl right in real life so like if you stay focused on your goal and your target in web 3 and you make every effort to progress your skills to match where you want to get to you will get there and you will meet the people that you um you will meet the people that you need to meet and make those connections that you needed to make and that for me has has just proven itself again and again and again and it, and it sounds similarly like what you've just said you know like um the plan for you is is to surround you with people you need at the time and um you know, you could take that however you want to take it, but it just, it, it, there's something going on, you know, within this ecosystem. I think that um, it certainly goes a, le a lot unspoken uh, because it's an odd topic to talk about when you're talking about technology. Um, but yeah, it's interesting you say that, man. That's kind of my take on, on a similar aspect. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of people forget to realize like there are still people behind the screens and um there's there's the saying that light attracts light right like if you if you surround yourself with good people good people just keep coming in so i think that that happens but also uh you birth the kind of people that you end up attracting so if you're you end up filling yourself with uh scammers maybe you've also scammed just as hard or you're you're getting set up into a situation where you need to learn more of yourself to be more self-aware because i don't know the 
Solana and Web3 and honestly every every blockchain is cutthroat. There are no people always say there are no friends, but I think I've met some of the realest people in the space. And I think it's because at the heart of it it's it's what it is. Uh like minded people attract like minded people. Yeah. I completely agree with that man. Um and it goes to show, doesn't it? Um, and so you mentioned Dead King Society there. Um, I don't know enough about them. I'd love to know more. I love the art. Um, could you give us a little bit of info on that? Uh, Dead King Society is a 100 one of one collection where each member is individually vetted, where we're, I think, the the investor type is someone who one has the experience of the real world to to two not be over invested into illiquid jpegs but three carry themselves with their professionalism to um actually be people in the space who are relevant who have good insight and become a beacon of understanding and knowledge for everyone else in the ecosystem that's what we carry ourselves with um I entered initially with the idea that it would, well, it was a choice between them and Boogles, but I ended up coming into Dead Kings because I saw people that I respected, that I wanted to learn off of, and it's been it's been such a wild, welcoming journey where I know that I picked up skills and ideas that I probably wouldn't have in other communities. Like it's hard to find a very well curated community where some of the biggest and wisest minds are really there. I know people get afraid of it because there are people who have the capital to literally pump and dump floors and that's what puts people off. But stay long enough, you get to actually talk to people who are ages beyond how smart they actually are. And it's been such a fun experience. Um... There are a lot of ways to enter. Uh, I think more popularly as of recent, people have seen like those drafts for the nobles, which is sort of because each king, each king of the 100 has four nobles to to under his court. Um, those four nobles act as like um, horsemen to whatever their whatever initiative, whatever social or whatever activity these kings need to do. And they work like a team towards something that that Dylan has gamified that I don't think he's he's disclosed yet. But how it works is like each of these signets. So there are 400 signets circulating out there. Um, Each of them act as like a roster spot to a draft. And then you decide if you're signing up for the draft for each season. There are four seasons. And then in the draft, a certain amount of kings, uh, like 25 per season, um, they're up for auction, oh, up for drafting, and then you pick which uh, you pick on a draft list based on order, which is also randomized. Um, you pick which king you're getting into and which noble you're getting. So it's first come, first serve. If that noble gets taken, it's not yours to pick anymore. And each of the nobles also have one of one art. So it's a full identity, and you sort of have your own secret posse and, and shit which i think it's it's wow. it's innovative and fun and like um it's cool like beyond just the king and the lords of the kings um a lot of the nobles have just been like total total g's like super fun uh super skilled individuals as well These are the the unicorns, I think, in the in the NFT space. Like you say, it's so difficult to find a well curated um, a well curated community like that. And it sounds like you've you know you found one there because, again, you know, going back to the power of Web three is you can find yourself of any skill level, any financial ramification, you know, any level in life you can rub shoulders and have conversations with people way beyond your realm of 
real life reach, right? You you would never necessarily be able to um, speak to those people in real life, but yet Web3 allows you to share conversation, share thoughts and share knowledge and learn from people that, you know, you just wouldn't have the opportunity to do so anywhere else. And, um, you know, that's been really powerful for me. And it sounds like that um, Dead King Society um, has got that on lock. And I'm now feeling a little bit of FOMO. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, will have my eyes set on uh, on getting up to one of those I think um, because that for me is so like in my real life you know you always hear like when you when you listen to mentors and um, you know um, motivational speakers they're like surround yourself with people who are above your um, your knowledge, understanding, pay grade, whatever, you know, surround yourself with people like what you want to be. And in real life for me, that's been really difficult, you know, like it's um, it's not easy to find people like that. But in Web3, I have been able to do that, you know, and I've been able to learn from some really incredible people and meet some really incredible people. One of them being my co-founder, um, who's just a fantastic dude and shares my work ethic and sentiment um, in terms of like giving your all or nothing really. Um, so it's been a real pleasure that journey in Web3 and I think that's something that, that you know, if you are new to Web3, I think that's something to really consider is um, if you go in search of, um, you know, bettering yourself and leveling yourself up, that it is a great place to do it because there's no barrier to, to you meeting multi-millionaires or PhD doctors or you know like there, there's someone from everywhere in here and they're all willing to speak to you you know there's none of this uh, um, what do you call it like hierarchy I guess you're right you're right I often say though that in web3 it's unique in the sense that you can actually feel it that you can jump social classes just from existing in the space but also there's the learning that when you network, you don't network upwards, you network sideways, mm -hmm. which initially I didn't understand because, I mean, the world teaches us, at least all of these master classes teaches us in college that you need to go for like, go and learn skills from the people ahead of you. I think in Web3, what I've learned and I've learned this also from just um, staying in the space, when you network sideways, you sort of set yourself up to being in line to actually dominate because generations and the people around you are actually what propel the world forward. So instead of just chasing up after Michael Jordan, just be Kobe Bryant and stay in your lane. <laughs> I think that was I think that was something that opened my eyes to just why do I try to copy up after after Mike? when i am so good on my own i have everything else i have i have a new scenario a new paradigm that's all on me and the world's my cloister i think that that's something that i started to realize because when i started to network sideways i realized that i could solve people's problems that they don't know that if i carry them up we carry our generation up and when it it's sort of a generational thing that's just all together snowballing. You're sort of relentless, right? Like, you know how um, I always look at it as how, like, in basketball speak, because it's more obvious. But look what LeBron did when he came into the league um, compared to Mike. What Mike did, he just dominated. What LeBron did, he dominated and made everyone else dominate with him. So he created a generational group of talents which right now you're seeing an ecosystem in basketball where there are so many fucking all-stars yeah. compared to Mike's time where every team just had one, had two. So it makes sense. It makes sense. It made more sense when I started to compare it that way. And then you look at it in sports, sports now are on that level because a lot of them just built the generation. They didn't focus on just chasing up after the guy in Chicago. I love that. That is a fantastic analogy. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, the other day I went to a, like a local conference, a crypto conference, 
and you know like you say you, you you sort of look up and you're always trying to go up there but actually when you start going sideways you have a different experience and I went there with the thought that I was going to go and learn and there's going to be lots of people there with lots of experience and you know I'm going to speak to them and learn from them and actually as it turned out I sat there and I was just being questioned because I'd had the most time in the market I'd had more experience on on chains and and it was just it was quite a humbling experience and you know often you doubt yourself don't you in this space and sometimes you think oh you know am I doing things right and uh, have I actually learned anything but in reality you know these these sorts of things actually um reinforce the fact that you have done your 10,000 hours and and you you've been in an ecosystem that not many people know about for so long that you are ahead of the game compared to a lot of people and going upwards you won't always notice that but going sideways you not only meet people who have got different skill sets but um, it reinforces your own and um, that's been really good 100% 100% awesome man well listen I know my kids are about to come home and start screaming at us <laughs> um, and so I think this is a, a good place to, to wrap things up and I wanted to just um, ask you, you know, if people want to find you, they want to reach out, they want to use your advisory service, where do you want them to go? Um, you know, where's the best place to find you and get in touch with you? Um, best is on Twitter. Like, I'm probably easier to respond to on Twitter. You can always tweet me and just say, can you DM me? I think I'm just as responsive or my PA can actually get it. Yes, I do have to have a PA now because of all the inquiries. It's been wild. Um, Discord DMs, because I'm at the 1,000 friend list, that might be difficult, but you can always just yell and dance in the Pharaoh server. I will get to see it. Don't worry. There you go. Um, and, you know, follow Snooze on every social platform you can. Get into the Alpha Pharaohs um discord and check out their tomb raid platform and just get involved if you want to start earning money in web3 and you have no idea how to do it tomb raid has got you um it's public it's familiar it's easy to use you can go there you don't need any nfts or wallets you can just go and do that so i highly suggest checking them out snooze it's been an absolute pleasure um speaking with you and um you know i look forward to having you on again uh, maybe towards the alpha pharaoh's um art uh, upgrades and stuff that you're doing or, or i shouldn't call it upgrades because it's fantastic but you know like reformation and i know i'm hoping to get tim um on the podcast and maybe we can get the three of us going and and really get some alpha going on alpha pharaohs but it's been a real pleasure and an honor to have you on here man um i appreciate by all means man it was it was my pleasure uh i enjoy doing this because i mean there's a lot of there's a lot more knowledge when you just share your thoughts freely so yeah I, i'm down for anything man awesome um i'm definitely uh we'll, we'll stay on i'm going to uh gonna end the stream but we'll uh we'll just stay on for it for a summary and um yeah guys every week i hold this podcast every tuesday um 1600 normally this was all a bit of a time um a time issue because of the multiple time zones that we're all working through so this isn't the normal time we host it it will normally be 1600 uh est 2000 gmt um if you know of projects founders entrepreneurs or you yourself want to come up um we'd be really happy to have you up hit me up in dms um i'm YSE NFT uh, on twitter and obviously unify is my project and that is where you can also find us uh, our discord is open all the links are in the description and we really look forward to seeing you next week so thanks for all of you that tuned in and thanks for watching those who are you know come for the recording take care guys thank you <sighs> boom let's go oh that was awesome man that was really natural and um 
you know, I think that was a really, really valuable conversation. I would love to have heard some of that information way back when I got in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I, tr I hope I tried to uh, save a lot of people their their like eight hundred dollars to consult me for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, I think you know the 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 podcast has been really interesting, like utility or a tool to have as a project because um, you know, like is it next week? I think next week I've got a web two dude who um he invented this app you know and it's got like over a million downloads on um um itunes um and it, you know it just gives us a great platform to speak to new people in the um in the discord that wouldn't necessarily uh sorry to speak to people in real life that you wouldn't necessarily be able to reach to because you know they're just so um yeah, so they're not going to answer an email, but an opportunity to feature on a on a podcast <laughs> allows promotion, right? <laughs> it does. It does. It, it's it's good. It's good when you can monetize it on Spotify as well, because I think after like a two thousand subscriber level, you start getting paid by Spotify. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'll look yeah, into yeah. that. I'll look into that for sure. The next one I'm doing, I'm actually going to switch software because I found a way where I can stream live onto Twitter at the same time as YouTube. You should get in touch with Soul Investor and the Value Vibes podcast team because mm -hmm. I think they've been trying to expand and they do these. Uh, their, their podcast style is like Alpha and Market, which sounds like every Twitter space. Mm -hmm. But they have like a good platform that allows them to stream simulcast Spotify, YouTube, uh, Twitter. Nice. Yep. I will check that out. What was the other one you said? Soul Investor and what was the other project? No, uh, Soul Investor is the person. Uh, oh. Like he's a he's he's a regular on MySpaces, but uh, his podcast is like the Value Vibes podcast. There's like three of them that come there and just banter off each other yes. jet's been trying for ages to do a podcast but i keep telling him he's not interesting <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how interesting i am but i get interesting guests <laughs> <laughs> it's it's because it's honestly because jet when you notice how he is on spaces he stutters a lot mm -hmm. and it's because his mind is translating between thigh and english oh so, he he's trying he's trying but i know that's why he's not getting a lot of adoption yeah right yeah right and so um let me talk to you about unify man like how do you feel about it what do you think of the concept and that sort of thing i'd love a bit of feedback from you mm, I, i've told this to kieran a couple of times but his challenge down the line is really the fact that it's a two-sided marketplace is going to perpetually be a recurring problem. Mm -hmm. um, you could look at like similar job platform or job platforms because, like, uh, Sandbar or Rethinkable or what was the other one that had like job postings and shit. The problem is the fact that it you're you need two streams of you two funnels to actually make it work. One on the job poster side and one on the the job searcher. I think re, I think you guys have the same problem because it's just as hard what to find people who actually need to stay on the platform, and it's just as hard for people who need to come in and funnel. And double funnel is such a difficult uh, business model to deal with. Hmm. But you, could you understand, although I know Sandbar kind of reminds me of Fiverr, we have gone down more the line of, like, Amazon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but that's still a two-sided marketplace, Yeah. right? I mean, those are just examples, but okay, yeah, yeah. the fact that it's a two-sided marketplace is the main problem because you need demand on both sides. Yeah. Well, you need supply on one side and demand on the other. And then when where if supply is low on the the provider side then it becomes a demand problem to try to get them to come in now yeah 
because I'm thinking because we got the community marketing point is so I'm like if let's say if um, if Alpha Pharaohs came on and created their brand page you obviously have your e-commerce factor so you could do you know um, your merch or wherever else you wanted and then the other side of that coin is you then have the community so the idea is each brand would bring their community on to register as affiliates and then start promoting for them right and then they all get a commission of each sale that assumes that um people are that deep to actually execute on said actions mm -hmm. i think pharaohs is a unique case because we can turn signing up on to unify as like a task to earn contract yeah so we could actually drip feed it to spark plug you guys but that's only one community that you can activate um in reality there are only like 800 people active inside communities mm -hmm. you can even enter the cat server now i'll tell you they're only going to stay at 200 reactions max yep that that's how low it is so there's not a lot of servicing that needs to happen i think um I think at the most part, as long as it's a way to, because you have perpetual demand on the web two side, mm -hmm. right? Um, but on the web three side, as long as like there are projects who don't really mind um, staying hoisted there and just um, using it as a funnel to funnel their business, because there's also not a lot of web three projects that actually have business yeah um it might actually work as long as there's a strong bd push on the web two side yeah so we've got this fucking awesome automation dude right from tiktok he's an influencer from tiktok he specializes in zapier automation he's built us a web two facing funnel that essentially is a lead magnet um, where you generate an NFT collection and we collect your information and then you receive that NFT collection in your um, in your email. So that's going to be like our big Web2 push. Obviously, like we're going to target the, the Fiverr and the Amazon sellers and everyone else, um, as well as the fact that influencers can then take ownership of their audience and monetize that audience, you know. So... Yeah, I, I fully get what you what you're saying though. There there is the demand issue. Um but I'm confident we can get around it. I'm confident we can. I, I just think I just think that like that's the one one challenge cuz I'm seeing across the board mm -hmm. when when I talk to like Angel and VC and Startup World when they start seeing the word NFT on any of these pitches they treat it like the plague, my guy. Yeah, we haven't mentioned it at all because we're not. We haven't even got an NFT collection. The idea is we are a platform like Magic Eden um, or OpenSea. That's how we're pitching ourselves. Mm. We'll see. It, it it's an interesting strategy, but. I don't know. Um, Web three's just not been not been cooking at all. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. You are absolutely right. And I mean, again, we're probably like a few months away from like full launch. Um, you know, like going public. So I'm hoping sentiment will change. Um, but you know, so did did Kieran mention the upsell side of things? Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool, man. Well. Um, yeah. Uh, I have a four hour drive tomorrow. I'm not looking forward to it. Oh man. Where are you based? <laughs> um right now I'm in uh the summer capital, so Baguio City, which is six hours into the mountains. Uh I'm traveling into the capital tomorrow for your work. So oh, wow. in in face meetings, I don't really enjoy these in face meetings, but I don't know. Banks are backwards. Archaic, yes. <laughs> Archaic as fuck. Yep. So 
Sweet. I keep saying no to banking clients, but I don't know. My boss keeps just sending banking clients my way. Oh well, there's 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 bigger problems to have. <laughs> True. True. <laughs> Definitely bigger problems to have. Um, and so what? Thoughts wise, like we would like to raise some money. What do you think the odds on that are? Like, do you think we can, as what we are, like, can do that? We applied for a Solana Foundation grant. Um, but yeah, what do you think? I think a grant is like the best possible means to do it. You guys don't need an NFT raise because although it's good publicity. It's it's four thousand mouths to feed. Yep. And save yourself the mental the mental strain. Um I think Solana Grant and probably Magic Eden Grant. Oh could the, be Magic, the way forward. Did Magic Eden do that? Yeah, Magic Eden have a grant as well. Oh. Like a creator's grant. Nice. And do you think because to me, I feel like Magic Eden could do what we're doing. Do you think they would? No, they wouldn't. Okay. Magic Eden is all about um, creating volume. Like when you talk to their leadership more, you understand that their main KPI and OKR is just volume creation. Okay. And that's why they've never focused on like uh, creator economy and like upping, uh, upping the quality of projects. Interesting. Okay, cool. You could talk to uh, the Phase team, like the Phase Labs guys. I know Kieran's close to them, but uh, Devour and Kimosabi have. They're building something interesting that I think what you're doing might actually play like an interesting piece of the pie. Especially if you guys can pivot towards not only like a Web3 portfolio, but also giving Web3 projects access to VC. Okay. Like a VC marketplace as well. So that beyond just the, the whole um, Web3 arsenal of what Web3 can do, you also have a way to activate Web3 people into what Web2 can do for them. Yep. A hundred percent. Yeah, I agree. And it's like, you know, the automation guy I was speaking about, he's coming onto the platform. So then he'll be able to offer automation services for Web3 products to help with marketing and, and just day-to-day -day running of the business. And the, yeah, yeah, that's the even, idea, yeah. Or even factory services. Like if there's if there's a provider for like automated guided vehicles, um, a lot of these merch projects could you actually expand into like robotic warehouses mm -hmm. or outsourcing robotic warehouses that will up, that will minimize their cost yeah we've also got our APIs so you'll be able to install our analytics dashboards and everything else independently to like mm. existing platforms the thought was to make that our main affiliate product as well for the um for our community members, you know, that works, yeah. Yeah, it was cool. We did, we saw the affiliate creation and the brand pages last night. It's freaking good. First time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I'm spent, so I'm uh, call it the night and try to <laughs> try to slow down a bit. Do it, brother. As I say, absolute pleasure, man. And, um, you know, appreciate your, your time afterwards as well. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely stay in touch. And, um, yeah. Anytime, anytime. Thanks, man. Pleasure. Bye -bye. Take care, man. Bye.